Well, good morning, friends. Oh, come on now. Good morning, friends. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. It is truly an honor to be here this morning. I want to first thank Pastor Laura, Michael, uh, Kate, and all the others who have extended gracious hospitality to me. Uh, he's not here, but of course, a special thanks to your senior minister who extended this invitation. I also, before preaching, I'd like to, of course, extend greetings on behalf of the communities I serve um, and the communities I am a part of. On behalf of the Disciples Seminary Foundation in Claremont, we extend greetings. And on behalf of my local congregation, where my wife is the pastor, I have no place where I can misbehave because I go home and the pastor comes with me. <laughs> but uh, on behalf of uh, Downey Memorial Christian Church and Pastor Daphne, I extend greetings as well. Thank you again for your welcome. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Amen. Ultimately, what makes us human, truly human, is relationship. In the Christian tradition, a central theological affirmation is that we were created by a relational God for relationship. Whether it is Genesis 1, where the image of God is contained jointly in both female and male, or Genesis 2, where God declares that it is not right for the human to be alone. At the core of our self-understanding as human creatures is that we have a relational DNA, if you will. We were created by, with a relational posture towards God, towards others, and even towards creation. We were created in relationship. After all, we all depended on human mothers to get here. We were created in relationship, and we were created for relationship. We're, we're, we're relational beings. Unfortunately, we don't always live fully or faithfully into our inherent relationalness, relationality towards others and the world, whether it be the systematic killing and incarceration of black bodies in the name of keeping the so-called peace, or the wholesale labeling of our brown sisters and brothers as rapists and murderers, or the demeaning of women through the blatant acts of sexual exploitation and the insidious reality of unfair pay, or the isms and phobias that foster hatred and division among the human family along the lines of race, class, religion, or sexual identity, or even the degradation of creation due to our own insatiable consumer habits. We have done violence to the other and to the world. We have chosen safe sameness over sacrificial sharing. Singularity over plurality. We have not always lived into our innate interrelatedness. You see, what's behind all these isms and phobias, the underlying philosophy, the undergirding ethos of all this is a definition of the human being, of the human person, that gives exclusive reign to the individual over the community. Primacy is given to the, quote, singular rational being, that's the definition of the human given by Boethius, the medieval philosopher, the singular rational being over her or his relations. Now, I'm not suggestion, suggesting that individuality should not be honored. It should. I am instead stating that individualism is holding us hostage. The primacy of the self 
over her relations is funding and fueling our destructive patterns as a society today. Yet to understand our humanity apart from our relations means that we don't fully understand our humanity. We have a truncated view of who we are, a shrunken view of who we are. And this truncated, shrunken view has negatively shaped our politics and our ethics and our economics and our very being in the world. We have used this non-relational and even anti-relational view of the self to justify our ill treatment, our ignorance, our indifference towards the suffering of others, especially those who are unlike us. We speak of the self-made man, and yes, I emphasize man. We say that the goal is to be self-sufficient, as if anybody ever has been. We advise the less fortunate to pick themselves up by their bootstraps, though they may not have boots. We give priority to me over we. And as a result, we have a truncated view of what it means to be human. It was that great pastor activist William Sloan Coffin who once said this, the smallest package in the world is a man all wrapped up in himself. Smallest package in the world is a man all wrapped up in himself. If Reverend Coffin is right, and I think he is, then we live in a, in a country chock full of small packages. We see it in commercials and ads that stroke, constantly stroke our egos. We see it in the way we speak and in the assumptions that we make. In fact, according to a Pew poll, the United States ranks the highest among all nations in terms of those who believe that it is only the individual with little or no outside forces that can determine his or her success. The individual stands alone in this vision supposedly self-reliant, self-made, self-assured. The smallest package in the world is a man all wrapped up in himself. Yet this posture of enclosure, this all wrapped up in oneselfness, this, this is what is killing us. The theologian Catherine Tanner speaks of sin in these terms. For her, sin is that which shrinks us into ourselves. That's what she uses, that language. That which encrusts us, hardening us to all that which is not us. That which makes us callous and unable to be open to the rest of creation or its creator. The late evangelical theologian Stanley Grenz concurs with Tanner and defines sin as the disruption of community, or the disruption of communion. Sin is the disruption of community, of relationship, of our deepest interconnectedness. This is why the reformer Martin Luther preferred this definition of sin. Sin is separation. This disruption of community has had cosmic effects, as St. Paul declares to the Romans. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it. The whole creation has been groaning with labor pains until now. In his Paradise Lost, John Milton alludes to this image of a bruised creation corroded by human sinfulness when he writes, Earth felt the wound and nature from her seat, sighing through all her works, gave signs of woe that all was lost. Our community disrupting ways has wounded not just ourselves, but our neighbors near and far, and even the very ground on which we trod. The whole creation 
has been groaning. So where do we go from here? Are we left to the small packages that is us? Well, if sin, if sin is that which shrinks us, which encrusts us, calcifies us, then it follows that salvation is the act of being re-expanded, reopened to the world and to its creator. For the theologian Tanner, being made in the image of God is not about being rational beings, so that's been the classical sort of definition of being made in the image of God. For her, she says that being made in the image of God means possessing as, as beings, as human beings, an elasticity, a fluidity that allows us to stay open to creation, to other, and to the other, that is, to God. So to restore that image, that is, salvation, in us means the re-elasticizing of ourselves so that we may fully live as relational beings. Love that image. Becoming elastic again. This is precisely what we find in the sort of subtext of St. Paul's words to the Roman faithful. Hear his words again, verse 22 and 23. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, for the redemption of our bodies. See, these groans, these groans paradoxically point to the good news of our text this morning. The good news embedded deeply in our scripture that we read. Creation groans, we groan, the Spirit groans. What is at play here, what is implied here is this. We discover our truest selves when we open ourselves radically to others and to creation, sharing both in its pain and its hopes. For it is, after all, shared pain and shared hope. You see, how we speak of salvation needs to change. Salvation is not me and Jesus are BFFs best friends forever. It's not that we are saved and those people are going to burn in hell. It's not even that we're going to leave this world and float away. No. Salvation is resetting all that is back into right relationship. What Paul calls elsewhere in the Corinthian correspondence as reconciliation. Reconciliation, God's reconciliation, does not just impact the human heart. I'm sorry, that's a small gospel. Dr. Phil can address my human heart. Rather, in the incarnation, in Christ, all that is was taken up to God, says Maximus the Confessor. Paul did not come up with this cosmic vision of salvation on his own. He may want to say he did, but he didn't. But rather, he inherited it from his Jewish roots, especially the creation stories of Genesis, where the ground, the dirt, the earth, the Hebrew word is Adama, is the substance from which the first human, Adam, is made. You see the connection? God takes Adama to make Adam. As the Bible scholars Ron Allen and Clark Williamson assert, the destiny of the earth and of the human being have been tied up with each other from the very beginning. Thus, we discover our truest selves when we open ourselves up radically to others and to creation. No, let me, let me not exactly, let me rephrase that. We discover our truest selves when we are radically opened up to others, and to creation by the Spirit. Likewise, the Spirit, verse 26, likewise the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. I'm all about agency. 
Part of the problem with rampant individualism is that the agency of some is denied. But I agree with the philosopher Martin Heidegger who says there's something greater than agency. It's what he calls receptivity. Being open to something greater than us that lifts us beyond what we can see or imagine. The spirit intercedes in us. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. The Spirit unwraps our small, packaged self. The Spirit opens up our isolated selves. The Spirit saves us. Here's the good news. We cannot break from our small packages. They're tightly wound. We cannot shed the crust by ourselves, after being calcified, we on our own cannot become elastic and cannot become open to the relations that constitute us as truly human persons. Thanks be to God. The good news is that the work of re-elastizing our being, the work of reopening ourselves to the world is not a self-initiated achievement. Rather, it is gifted to us by God who through God's very life as spirit initiates that transformation as an act of grace. It is God who saves us from ourselves. It is God who rescues our true selves from our false selves. It is through the giving of the spirit that we again are opened up as we were intended to be, as we were intended to be in the world, toward the world, for the world. Contrary to popular versions of the Christian faith, to be spiritual is not about detachment from the world. It is about a deeper journeying in and with the world. Contrary to some distorted visions of Christianity, to have the spirit in us is not about escaping, but about engaging. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of life precisely because she and the spirit was feminine in the earliest Christian traditions because she is the spirit of connection, of relationship. Since God is love itself, we can then say that the spirit is relationality itself. Relationality is self. Diane Eck of Harvard affirms this and thus calls the Spirit the go-between God. Isn't that delightful? The thread of connection in the world, the Spirit. The Catholic theologian Anselm Kjonsok Min concurs. He writes this, he says, the distinctiveness of the Holy Spirit lies precisely in being wholly relational, and as such is the divine source of all relations, communions, and solidarities. She, the Spirit, is relationality itself. Thus, to claim to be filled with the Spirit, church, means to live into our full humanity in and for the world, in and for creation. So you, church, you, yes, you, inside you, poured into you by God, is relationality itself. That interconnectedness that brings the whole universe together, that interweaving that makes the universe what it is, that connection, that glue is inside you. You, no pressure. To be filled with the Spirit is nothing less and nothing else than being being stretched by relationality itself so that our truly human, open posture towards the world, a life-giving openness, may be inculcated and sustained in our being in the world, in the way we live in the world. You are filled with relationality itself. So what does this mean for us, for Christians, for those who live the life of the Spirit. 
Well, if it means affirming our interconnectedness of pain and hopeful expectations with others and with creation, if the spiritual life is one of deep, engaging, relational being in the world, how then might we live into that reality, into our interrelatedness with God, others, and creation? How might we work out this salvation, this reconciliation given to us? Well, the first is this. We must lament the separation, the severing experienced in the world and in creation. We must groan, groan in the spirit. You see, before we can pronounce, we must denounce. Before we can pronounce, we must denounce. As the activist Jim Wallace once said, the gospel is not only the promise of all that will be, It is also a threat to all that is. As the church, we must reclaim the practice of lament. We must expose the calcifying, encrusting, small package wrapping activity in the world. Now, I know this doesn't seem nice, but as I frequently say, we're called to preach good news, not nice news. Our niceties have nullified our voice for way too long. Our niceties have silenced us when we needed to speak. Our niceties have kept us sitting when we needed to stand up. Our niceties have made us not show up. We preach good news, not always nice news. In order to be prophetic, to be faithful, to be the church, the church must denounce must lament, must cry out publicly with groans too deep for words. For every life shot down, the church must lament. For the insidiousness of greed that leaves many with little to none, the church must lament. In the face of racism and xenophobia that exclude instead of embrace, the church must lament. For discrimination that befalls our queer sisters and brothers, the church must lament for all the ways that the community of God is disrupted. The church must lament. The church must lament in the steps of this very chancel and in the steps of Congress and even in the virtual steps of social media. The church must lament. Uh, But since... We serve the God of resurrection. Lament is never the last word for the church. As that psalmist declare, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. We lament, and here's the second thing we do, so that we may act in hope. You see, hope is not wishful thinking. As in, I hope no one's in my seat this morning, or I hope this preaching is finishing soon. That's why we skip over lament and get to hope, because we have the wrong vision of hope. Hope, rather, is the confidence, the sturdy confidence, that despite all the evidence to the contrary, God's future promise for creation will come to pass. Hope is trusting in the God of creation and new creation, in the God of life and new life, in the God of the resurrection. As our scripture today proclaims, verse 24, for in hope we are saved. It was that great North African theologian, St. Augustine, who rightly said this of hope. He said this, hope has two beautiful daughters, anger and courage. Anger at the way things are and courage to work so that they don't stay as they are. First Congregational Church of Los Angeles. Our hope is an active hope. It requires and calls for action. To hope as Christians is to act. Hope means that we work boldly for that interconnectivity, for that reconciliation, knowing that illness will not remain. We work boldly knowing that sorrow won't endure. We work boldly knowing that the disruption of community will not last. We work boldly knowing that injustice will not reign. We work boldly knowing that death will not have the last word. Hope 
means that we live boldly in the Spirit, knowing that wholeness, that joy, that community, that justice, that life, that God will have the last word. Hope is to act in the power of the Spirit. That's right. The Spirit, the Spirit that blew at creation, the Spirit that anointed the prophets, the Spirit that was over the prophet Mary as she glorified God, the Spirit that was in Jesus empowering his ministry of the kingdom, the Spirit of Pentecost, the Spirit of the upper room, that holy fire, that mighty wind, that power from on high, this Spirit is in you as you work. This spirit, relationality itself, is with you. First, church, let the spirit open you up to the world. Let it open you up. Trusting that God will have the last word.